Hello everybody, welcome to Monster Mondays, episode 14. Now, in our last episode, we went over the jacks, as it were. And, uh... Well, I realized after the fact that I forgot one of the Jack stories, but probably because it was fairly short at the time, and I figured I'd save it for a, a time when we've had something a little longer to deal with. And there's a few other monsters I've overlooked till now that were made around the same era as Jeff the Killer, and... Um, things of that nature, you know, more lost, um, episode-type stuff that became famous, and then spawned its own series of madness, as it were. So with that being said, there was a lot of things that went interesting with the, uh, last episode, as it were, so... Because of that, I've opted not to use um, music for this one, all the commercial interruptions and things. And if there is to be any music, I'll probably add it in later, in post-production. It's a risk, but um, it's something I've been thinking about doing. Or I may just omit it altogether for now and until I make a final video out of all these different series. Anyway, without any more dawdling, let's start with our first story called Clockwork, Your Time Is Up. And apparently it has a rating of 7.52 out of 10. Not too shabby, I guess, but probably not all that special, I'm guessing. A little girl sat in her room. Her messy brown hair was put into little pigtails as her hazel eyes stared at the door. She hugged her stuffed giraffe close to her petite body and listened closely to the loud yells of her father and mother. I wonder if she should have had any damned kids, screamed a loud deep voice. All they do is make messes, complain, and draw on the walls. It was interrupted by the shrill angry yell of the girl's mother. They're children, David. They don't know any better. Oh, fuck me, Mary Beth. I don't want to hear your bullshit excuses. I've had just about enough of them. Oh, I forgot to mention, as I always do, the Monster Mondays, I don't I don't tend to censor myself. I mean, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, so... Uh, yeah, but too late um, for regrets at this point. What do you plan to do about it? The girl heard loud footsteps coming towards her room, and she hugged her giraffe closer. The door opened violently, and the doorway stood her large infuriated overweight father in one of his meaty hands. He held a large textbook. David, stop it! screamed his mother. The father ignored his wife's pleading cries. He grabbed the little girl harshly by the collar, and she screamed and kicked, trembling in fear. The girl's father held up the textbook. This is for drawing on my fucking walls, you little bitch. Years later, the little girl known as Natalie was now nine years old. Going through the stage of puberty, she was naturally a little chubby. As usual, she sat in her room watching TV. Her dad was ranting on about some economic crap that she could really give less of a shit about as she munched on some popcorn. She was also currently drawing a picture. There was a bit of gore in it, but strangely, she really liked drawing blood. It gave her some weird satisfaction. Other than that, multitasking was no problem for her. It became apparent to her at a young age that after having to do so much hard work and labor, she could she could do so many things at once. Drawing ended up being her talent and passion. It was her way away from escaping from reality whenever something terrible would rear its ugly head and peer in, or when she was simply bored. She suddenly heard the closing door and looked to the left, pausing on munching her popcorn. There stood her brother, Lucas, who was 14 years old. What is it she could still hear her father's yelling from outside her door? Dad's scaring you? He let out a chuckle. No way, I think we're both used to his yelling by now. There was a long pause, so why are you in here? He played with his sleeves and twitched a bit. I have to ask you something. He trained his eyes on her. 
She frowned slightly, growing impatient with her brother, interrupting her movie and drawing. What? He moved a little closer. You said you wanted to be cool and grown up like a teenager, right? She, s she nodded and suddenly brightened up slightly. Well, I have an offer. Just spit it out, you dimwit. You know what? What guys and girls do together sometimes, right? The next day of school, Natalie did not say a word. She did not speak for the whole day, nor did she have anyone to talk to anyway. Nobody could know, nobody should know, and so nobody would know. Her teacher picked up a few of her puzzled expressions, but she just dismissed them as if she did not understand the lesson. Natalie also felt as if she was in severe pain. She had no idea it could hurt. Feeling scared, Natalie walked home and silently went to her room, but later in the day, she was once again greeted by her brother. Nobody would know. At school, she finally decided to tell someone, even though they weren't her friends. She just felt she had to. She walked up to a group of girls she'd occasionally seen in the hallway. They looked like nice girls. And they and Natalie sometimes talked before. Hey, Mia, the ginger girl looked over at Natalie with a straight face. Yeah, Mia said to Natalie, I uh, really need to talk to you about something. It's been going a while, on for a while, and you and your friends, well, I feel like you're the only people I can trust. Me and her friends seemed to pull out little smirks, but only for a moment. Little did Natalie know they were hungry for gossip. Oh man, this story. You can trust this, what's up? One day later was all it took. She'd been getting constant remarks on social networking sites such as Facebook. One time someone even called her a whore, not to mention that her lunch ended up getting in her hair. Lunch. It would be the least of her problems, but Natalie being only nine could only help but be greatly upset by this fact. However, she did not cut, she did not peep, she did not say a word about it. As you may recall, she had kept everything inside so far on this journey. She supposed it was better. She wouldn't let any pain get the best of her. 3 a.m. school night, her mother was going to kill her. The girl known as Natalie was now 16. She was productive in high school, close to her honor, to the honor roll. For once, she felt calm and happy, though like the usual. She would occasionally become a hermit in her room. Hiding away from her dad, he still liked to constantly yell and scream about the economy, money, and politics, and all the other bullshit that she was flat out tired of hearing. Her eyes started to feel heavy. She had an assignment to work on, but that was no longer important to her. All that was on her mind was sleep. She closed her laptop after her eyes adjusted to the darkness slightly. She saw her old worn-out, stuffed, worn-down stuffed giraffe in the corner. She stared at it in complete and utter silence. Memories passed through her mind. She felt tears come to her eyes, but quickly she blinked them back. No more breaking, she thought to herself, but she continued to stare at it. The fuck are you looking at, she said to the stuffed object. It simply stared back with the soft, black, beady eyes. She shook her head and stood up. She looked down sadly at the little toy animal and gently picked it up in her arms. She cradled it and spoke softly to it. I I'm sorry. Some tears she ran down her face. She pets its rough, short fur softly as she lay it down on her bed and slowly went to sleep. She was woken up by angry growls of her mother. Exhausted, she slowly opened one of her eyes. I can't believe I forgot to take that laptop away. You were on it all night, weren't you? Natalie sighed and pressed her face deeper in the pillow, hugging her giraffe closer. Mother sighed and walked out. She took a shower, brushed her teeth, and ate some breakfast. She then got dressed. She put on a gray and black hoodie with fur inside the hood. It wasn't her favorite, but it was the only one she could wear in school due to the others being in the wash. She also put on black jeans and some thin, fashionable boots. She finally went down the stairs to get driven to school. She hopped in the car and the mom sped off. On the way there with lack of sleep, she put her head against the window of the car and began to drift off. Her dreams were miraculously nightmares. Insisted firstly of her physical abuse as a child, and secondly of the sexual abuse she had suffered at the hands of her own brother, Lucas. The abuse lasted for four years before she had the guts to turn him away. She started twitching and was cringing in her sleep, but her mom took no notice. Her mother never took notice. Suddenly, she was jolted awake by the sound of her mother's voice. We're here, her mother said with annoyance in her voice, most likely from catching Natalie napping again. She looked at the large sign of the school, which read Walkerville Collegiate, Collegiate Institute for the Creative Fine Arts. She sighed tiredly and stepped out and put her backpack on her shoulder. See as she proclaimed as she closed the car door. 
She walked into the school and chatted with a couple of friends until she walked up to her locker on the third floor. She grabbed her books and before the five minutes were over, she ran to class. The English teacher annoyingly put her hand on Natalie's desk. Where's your assignment, Miss Owlet? Alice swallowed. I, uh, forgot it at home. Sorry, Miss Hominuk. Your time is up, Miss Owlet. Don't disappoint me. Alice seemed puzzled by the thought for a moment. She didn't know why, but those words seemed to melt through her. Natalie simply ignored it and went back to listening to the lesson, falling asleep not too long after. Of course, later that day, she was heading to her locker for fourth period when suddenly her boyfriend, Chris, approached her. Him, talk to me after school, all right? She smiled. She loved talking to Chris. At the time, she didn't suspect anything. Chris was always sweet to her. During her French class, Natalie failed to pay attention. Instead, she doodled things she loved to draw the most. Blood, gore, people being stabbed, knives, and dreadful things of the sort. Others would say it was pretty dark to remove such items, but she saw nothing wrong with it. For some strange reason, it actually felt like a normal thing to her. Ms. Owlet? She quickly covered the doodles on her paper and quickly looked up at her French teacher, trying to interfere. Uh, yes, Miss Levasseur. With a slight turn of his head, he gestured for her to move her arm. Show me your work. She hesitantly moved her arm and showed her t teacher the picture of someone getting stabbed by an insane man. She just stared puzzled looking at her, but she smiled nervously. Erase that and get started on your work. He, had, he said in a strangely calm voice. He walked away, and Natalie sighed and began to erase the picture. And Miss Allett, Mr. Levasseur, interrupted. She looked at him slightly. Your time is almost up to get your work done. I suggest doing it now. She growled at the remark. Time always seemed to be against her. As far as she was concerned, time could go fuck itself. After class, she walked out of the school to find her boyfriend standing near the fence on the sidewalk. She smiled and walked over, hoping he had something to say that would cheer her up on this miserable day. But as she walked closer, her smile slowly faded. He wasn't smiling back. Chris, what's wrong? What did you want to talk to me about? He sighed. Natalie, I think it's time we should start seeing other people. He felt a heartbreak. But why? Natalie cried and responded with a stern look. It's your mindset, your drawings. They just creep me out. I think there's something really wrong with you. And the saddest part is you haven't told me why you're acting like this. It makes me feel irresponsible. So I just can't do it anymore. I'm sorry. And with that, he walked away. Really slammed her, heads on the, her hands on the bathroom counter at home. She stared at herself in the mirror, her eye twitching. I, I won't hurt me like the others. I can stay strong. There was a needle and, and black thread in her hand. It's pointless. It doesn't help. Some weird sensation pulled at her subconscious. She chuckled slightly. No, I'm doing it because I want to. She held up the needle and thread on one end of it and smirked. Time is up. Piece after piece, cut after cut. Even through excruciating pain going through her, she did not whine, she did not whimper, she did not cry. There were no more tears to shed. All she did was smile. Blood leaked from the pierces and made a low dripping noise into the sink on the counter. When she was finished, she stood back and admired her handiwork. She stroked the horrendous stitches on the sides of her mouth, which spread into a wide smile. Hmm, totally not mocking Jeff the Killer there, right? <laughs> she felt the warm, wet blood on her fingers and licked it gently, consuming the metallic-tasting liquid in pure ecstasy. She stopped when she saw her mother's reflection in the mirror behind her and sharply turned around. So her mother's wide eyes and pale face and looked at her fingers, seeing the blood. Suddenly, she suddenly felt the pain began to cry. Mom? Natalie cried. She never felt so confused. What had just happened to her? Her mother scheduled some therapy for her. Natalie had not gotten rid of the stitches, fearing how much pain it would bring. So she went to session with them. She made sure her hood was up as... Not to let anyone see. She sat down on the comfortable of their seat and stared at the blonde woman across from her in silence. So her name's Natalie, isn't it? Natalie nodded. I'm Deborah. I'm here to help. Now tell me, Natalie, what have been some of your problems recently? Natalie stared. Time. Time has been my problem. Deborah gave her a confused look. What about time, dear? Natalie's hands roughly gripped the leather of the seat. Everything. It makes you live through it, slowly progressing through life, being controlled by society, only to be 
torture to seemingly no end until you find you no longer have a purpose. The concept known as time is a vicious cycle of never ending slowing or never never ending slowing or speeding up. It is violent and makes you live through the torture over and over again. You're unable to fast forward through any of it. Natalie really had no idea what she had just said. She felt she wasn't herself anymore. Could this be because of all the things she'd kept contained? No, that was impossible. For some strange reason, she liked it. Therapist leaned in closer, sweetheart. I want you to tell me what's happened to you. Natalie continued staring. There was a long pause. She smirked slightly, the wounds from her stitches opening slightly once again. Why don't you tell me, Blondie? You're the expert. Deborah appeared mildly annoyed. Natalie, I can't help unless you tell me what's wrong. Natalie's fingers started to tear into the leather seating. Natalie isn't here anymore. With that, Deborah's eyes widened and she rose to her feet. I'll be right back. Please stay here. She walked out, leaving Natalie alone. Maybe she, maybe if she had done something at this point, she wouldn't have come to, to be what she is today. Possibly more people would be alive, and maybe she would be sane like she had been before. As much as I'd love to say that Natalie got up from the chair and stopped what came next from happening, I'm obligated to give you the horrid truth. Natalie did not move. She sat perfectly still in total silence and absolute calm in the chair, and after a while of waiting impatiently, her parents walked in. Natalie stood happy to go, but she noticed her parents' expressions. Even her father had a strange, sudden expression on his face. Her confusion grew, but she said nothing and followed them to the car. On the way, while she thought she was going home, she started to drift off. Strangely, she heard a dark voice speak in her dream. It almost sounded like her own, echoing into an internal abyss. abyss. Your time is up. She shot awake, some beads of sweat rolling down her face. She wasn't home, not in the car. She was... Not she was in a bed either, a white in a white a white bed in a white room. She looked to her side and realized she was hooked up to a heart monitor. She attempted to get up, but that's when she realized she was restrained. She panicked, she began to struggle and paused, but she when she heard a door open to her left, a man in white shirt looked at her. His hands behind his back, he resembled one of the cliched doctors you'd seen in a television program set in a scientific lab. She paid full attention to Mr. Sci as Mr. Scientist started to speak. I can only imagine how very confused you must be right now, he said, but I'm letting you know we're only here to help. Your parents allowed us, agreed to allow us to administer medication to you in hopes of helping your state of mind. Ellie opened her mouth to protest but was quickly silenced. You don't need to worry, the doctor sought to reassure. You'll be back to normal in no time, just try to relax. He walked over and, as he did, and he tried to skittishly move away, but was unable to due to the leather straps binding her wrists and legs. He carefully took a mask and put it over her mouth and nose. She stubbornly tried to get it off, but felt herself starting to slip under as the drugs kicked in and slowly her eyes shut. Suddenly, Natalie woke up. She couldn't comprehend what she was seeing. She she even been given multiple injections and something was being rubbed on her skin. She felt woozy, but was otherwise a, utterly aware of her surroundings. She was in a rare state patients sometimes find themselves undergoing surgery, in which they can see as they are being worked on. In this state, they can feel the pain, and the brain is active, but they cannot respond. Natalie, however, was able to. Her heart rate began to accelerate and reflected on the nearby monitor. The doctors took notice of this. They looked at her and took notice of her opened eyes. One of the doctors yelled at, the, at another. Natalie couldn't make out what they were saying, but she suddenly fought, felt a rush of adrenaline. Shaking violently, she started to slip out of her bonds. One of the doctors moved to hold her down, but then hesitated to do so. Natalie watched as all three of the doctors moved to hold her down, but she, as all three of the doctors backed away in unison. She sat on the edge of the bed, IV tubes from her arm and mask from her face. She got to her feet and started to stumble towards them. Her breath hitched and her vision was blurry. She was vaguely aware by then that she was chuckling like a madman. But suddenly she felt a searing pain in her chest. She gripped her chest in agony and dropped to her knees. She coughed up blood, fell prostrate, 
Pastrito on the floor and blacked out. Ellie woke up again, slowly and groggily, sometime later. She found herself back in bed and a doctor sitting beside it. I'm so sorry, Natalie. Something went horribly wrong. Ellie didn't know why, but she felt a tremendous amount of hatred towards the doctor. He took notice of her disgust and looked away instinctively. You weren't supposed to wake up while we were giving you the doses for your mental state. The doctor continued, we're not sure how it affected you, but we have a feeling we're going to find out. He paused for a moment before taking out a small mirror. The entire time he looked away from her. Regrettably, the medication impacted your appearance as well. Ellie looked at herself in the mirror. Her eyes widened. Her eyes were completely green. She knows she still had the stitches in her mouth as well, but for some reason she couldn't help but feel overjoyed. Her heart rate began to rise again. She gave a low chuckle. The doctor looked in shock as Natalie quickly moved toward him until she closed until she was close enough to feel her breath. Doctor, she began, still chuckling. He trembled slightly and pressed a button on the underside of the monitor. Yes, he stammered room in reply. Your time is up. A loud scream was heard in the halls of the facility. Two security guards rushed into the room, kicking open the door. Blood. Blood was the first thing they saw. Blood on the walls, on the bed, on the floor, even in the ceiling. Natalie had strapped the doctor to her bed, and the bed was, in a, was bent at a sharp angle. The doctor's spine was snapped entirely. Blood poured from his eyes, nose, and mouth. And there in the corner was the murderer happily drawing her gruesome pictures on the wall in blood. Along the hastily scrawled phrase, your time is up. Natalie slowly turned to look at the guards in a crazy wide grin upon her face. Hello, friends. W would you like to play? With that, Natalie began laughing uncontrollably. The guards quickly drew their guns, but Natalie charged at them, one of them before they could act. One of the guards fired around, but Natalie was able to dodge it. She grabbed a large knife and from a sheath in its pocket and slashed right across his waistline. Blood and organs flowed out, and he collapsed to the ground. She inhaled deeply, loving the damp stench of death. The remaining guard shook with fear and dropped his gun. She slowly walked up to him and placed the tip of the knife against his chest. Your time is up. She slowly slid the knife down his chest all the way down to, his, to the end of his abdomen. His organs spilled out on the floor and he collapsed dead. Allie's mother had been sleeping soundly in her room beside her husband. She woke to the sound of knocking on her door. She groggily got up and walked out of the bedroom to the front door. It was pouring outside and thunder boomed in the distance. She approached the door but paused before grabbing the knife the knob. She detected a faint sound of insane laughter. The rain and thunder seemed to quiet down suddenly. She pressed her ear against the door and listened closely. Hello, Mother, a voice from the other side called out. Nellie burst through the door, wielding two knives. Her mother stumbled back, hitting her head against a nearby ho coat rack. One of the hooks penetrated her skull, and she bled considerably from the resulting wound. She fell to the ground, paralyzed but still conscious, lying in a pool of her own blood. Natalie towered over her, knelt slowly to meet her at eye level, and proudly displayed her blood-soaked blades. I was suffering, mother, Natalie cooed. She ran the tip of the knife across her mother's cheek, cutting it slightly. Natalie tilted her head. But you did nothing. All her mother could do was shake and gasp like a fish out of water. Natalie grabbed her mother and gently laid her flat on the ground. From there, she straddled her and began cutting a V into her chest. Her mother could only grasp gasp and shake as the life drained from her. She choked and gurgled and her open breaths became labored. Natalie knew she didn't have much time left. She proceeded to forcibly open her mother's chest cavity with a loud crack. Reached in and grabbed her mother's still beating heart with her bare hand. Its pulses were growing farther and farther apart. Suddenly she ripped it out. Blood sprang all over her face. She stared at her mother directly in the face and took her final breaths. She took her final breath. Sweet dream, she said to her mother's corpse. Your time was up. She put her heart into her mother's mouth, patted her cheek softly, and stood up. She wasn't done yet. His father, David, had stirred awake and now realized his wife had not returned to bed yet. His eyes had only just adjusted to the darkness when suddenly he noticed Natalie was standing at his bedside with a crazed smirk plastered on her face and her newly green-tinted eyes glowing in the dark. She was covered in blood, and the scent was unbearable. 
She frowned dramatically. Oh dear, mother's gone. I wonder who will get the money. Natalie jeered. She swiftly grabbed her father's forehead, laughing maniacally. That's all you ever cared about anyway. Her father, unlike her mother, was a fighter, and he sprang up and grabbed Natalie by the neck and threw her to the ground. He started to stomp on her chest until she coughed up blood and stared down at her. Doesn't it feel good, Daddy? She laughed despite the violence and coughed up more blood. After all, you never seemed to mind doing it all those years ago, did you? He narrowed his eyes. You aren't my daughter. A wider smirk spread across her face and she peered at him with the luminous eyes, blood dripping down her mouth. You're right, I'm not. <laughs> she suddenly tripped him, causing him to fall hard onto the floor. She scrambled to her feet, knives in hand. They say the bigger you are, the harder they fall. <laughs> While he was wounded, she grabbed a pillow and stuffed it in his face, then stomped on it. With her greater intensity until loud, with greater intensity until loud cracking noise could be heard, when she finally pulled the pillow away, her father's face was gruesomely mutilated. He was making muffled noises and crying in agony. <laughs> What's the matter, Daddy? Pain too much for you? He shook. She shoved both knives into his stomach and, le and left them there. They moved to rip one of the large, heavy wooden poles from the bed. She set it down on her father's legs and withdrew the knives. Gonna need these, she chuckled and sat down upon the pole laid on his legs. Suddenly she started to rock back while sitting down. The weight from her body and the rod slowly began to squeeze his innards up through his body. He began to gag. The blood poured from his mouth. His breath was silenced and she hit a bit of a snag. Ugh, come on! She snarled as she forced herself to rock back and with more weight. Suddenly his organs burst out of his mouth, the nasty gore piled into the floor and the sides of his face. She nodded to his carcass and started to walk out. Your time was up, Daddy. <laughs> Finally, this would be her favorite part. She quietly snuck down to her brother's room, silently opening the door. The blood dripped from her knife, making a low tapping sound as the droplets hit the hardwood. Her brother wasn't in bed. It was apparent he must have been hiding somewhere. She grinned. Oh, dear brother, come now. She started to walk inside. All I want to do is have a little fun. <laughs> As she stepped in more, she listened closely for any sounds, any breathing and moving. She even sniffed the air for, the, for his putrid scent. And closer she listened. She finally noticed something, a faint breathing noise. Whack! She fell to the ground trembling. Her brother was behind her, an now bloodied baseball bat. He was going down with anger, panting in rage. She tried to slowly get up, but he hit her again and again and again. Mother always did like you best, you bitch. He hit her hard with one last time before taking a breather. She was bleeding heavily. Her green eyes dropped, drooped um, the faintly glowing, and glowing faintly in darkness. She felt weak and looked closer up at the ceiling. She recalled the days she had spent there, being tortured, having to go through her for four years, looking at the same damn ceiling. It sent a rush of energy into her body, and she started to stand, laughing insanely. <laughs> Jeez, she's one hearty motherfucker. Damn. <laughs> All right. And that wasn't in the story. That's just my commentary right now. I'm Normally, I'm not one for swearing if it's not in the story, but... Jesus. You know, they went all out with this one. <laughs> <laughs> her brother went to hit her again but used both knives to block it you're going to hail brother <laughs> with a large plush she sent her brother across the bed with a large push she sent her brother across the bed can you imagine a plush sending someone over the bed really okay <clears throat> I'll keep that in here cause you know we need a little humor amid the tragedy <laughs> He hit his head against the wall and growled angrily, about to lunge at her when she st stabbed the two knives into his arms, keeping them pinned on the wall. He screamed and struggled rapidly. Let's see what we can use here. She started walking around the room and smirked, seeing a simple butter knife on his bedside. She picked it up and walked over to him. They say that the eyes are the softest organs on the body. She slowly licked the knife. Soft as butter. He looked in horror, trying to get away as she started to dig out his eyes with the knife. He shrieked loudly, and she quickly tied a cloth around his mouth. Now, now, we can't have you waking the neighbors. 
He wasn't able to see anything. The pain was unbearable. Blood leaked violently from his eye sockets. He would cry, but he was now incapable. Hmm. She dug around for more items and picked up a pair of scissors. She walked over to him, crawling over him. I think you need to cut loose, brother. She stabbed the scissors with it into his gut. And he cried out in a muffled scream of pain. She treated him like arts and crafts, cutting through his skin like paper. She lifted up his large intestine and smirked wickedly. You know what I love? Macaroni art. She started to cut his the intestine into sections. This might be a little too big to put on a plate, though. She could hear his brother foaming blood on the mouth. However, he had to swallow the blood back because of the cloth around his mouth. Doesn't that taste good? She licked his blood off her fingers. I know, I, I sure know I like it. He let out another muffled scream. She went down to his toes and started cracking them and ripping them off one by one. Boy, that sounds a lot like my Adam the Forsaken creepypasta for, for a moment now. Did she happen to see it before it was taken down when I originally wrote it? And got inspiration from it? Or did we just happen to have the same idea at the time? I don't know. But I'm pretty sure this didn't come out until long after my creepypasta was either taken down or put up at some point. Because I think this copyright was like 2012, 2013. I believe I posted mine about 2009, 2010. Yeah. Still, weird coincidence here. <laughs> After a while, his screams grew futile. His throat was raw and bloody by now. Next, she worked on his fingers. Okay, I didn't snap anyone's fingers off, so I guess it's original. <laughs> Snipping them off and ripping them off slowly. The gurgling became louder and he started to squirm. He was choking on his own blood. He pulled the cloth down and blood poured from his mouth and turned his head to the side and vomited violently. There, there, brother, she said, patting his head. Eat this and feel better. She stuffed one of his fingers in his mouth, making it jam into his throat. He choked and slowly died. Your time was up. The girl known as Natalie was walking into her room, dripping blood off the corner. She saw her stuffed giraffe. She knelt down and stared at it, and without a word, she stood up and walked to the bathroom. Staring at herself covered in blood, she heard a faint ticking noise. She looked down and saw a pocket watch. She stared at its hand slowly, turning, listening to the ticking for what seemed like an eternity. She took out one of her now red knives as it heavily dripped blood onto the counter. She grabbed the pocket watch and disassembled it until only one tiny clock was left. Time makes you live through the torture, she said, slowly bringing the knife up to her eye. Slowly progressing through life, being controlled by society, she started to slowly dig it into her eye, as the vision left in her left eye grew blurry and red, until you find you no longer have a purpose. She felt her eyes start to come free from its socket, blood pouring into the sink. It's a vicious circle. She felt it dangle out of her socket, a sharp pain where it was connecting to her head. Time does not speed up, it does not slow down, it is violent. She grabbed the cord of her eye and tore it right off, the look falling into the sink. It makes you live through the torture over and over again. She started to place the clock in her eye. And I built a fast forward away from it. There was a squashing sound and drips of blood until it seemed like the clock fit perfectly in her socket. I am clockwork. The young 16 year old girl, formerly known as Natalie, walked away from her burning house. The flames engulfed everything inside the giraffe slowly burned, and with the carcasses of her family. Some say she still lives on, carrying her insanity with her, leaving so many dead, saying she decided when their time should come to an end. The only way to detect your presence is if you're cuddled close in the covers at night, sleeping soundly, but the, in the darkness she watches, she determines. You hear ticking. You see a green flash of putrid clock eye. If she is there, you know your time is up. Credit to Soft Boys, formerly known as Lucid. DeviantArt, um, Twitter. Final thoughts? Wow, that was a very good um, follow-up to, like, a Jeff the Killer type story, and 
It's kind of interesting that she cut off specific, you know, organs like fingers and toes and things to on, on the one she hated most. It kind of reminded me of how in the Adam Forsaken story, although he did it to someone he didn't particularly care that much about, you know, but whose folks had tattled, it was kind of interesting to see that kind of connection come back to me, and I think to myself, hmm, could this could this author have possibly seen my original pasta before it was taken down off the creepy pasta wikia, and thus that gave her the idea to take off the limbs, or was that just, you know, a common trope that she pulled from at the time? I'm not sure. But all I know is I can say it was fun to, to try and voice, well, a, ma a more masculine sounding version of her, because I don't really do well with feminine evil voices as much. That being the case, um, yeah, I'd say it's about a 7 out of 10. If I gotta be honest, my grandma really kind of butchered up some of her original work, I think, on that one, and mainly because I was trying not to have monotonous sentences, but I think that was part of what made it good, you know, in a way. You know, the phrasing, although pretty repetitive, you know, it, it kind of gave itself the um, charm of it, you know, in a way. It, that is, it added to the whole depths of depravity, the insanity within her. Anyway, that being the case, um, there were some other parts where the grammar wasn't all there that I legitimately said that, you know, saw that Grammarly made a good correction for it. But, um, you'll have to check the original story linked below and, and see how it compares to what I just read. With that, I turn you to our next story, Dead Bart. Rated 6 points... Rated 7.67 out of 10 from 1.57 thousand votes. You know how Fox has a weird way of counting Simpsons episodes? They refuse to count a couple of them, making the number of attacks inconsistent. The reason for this is a lost episode from season one. Finding details about the missing episode is difficult. No one who is working on the show at the time likes to talk about it. From what has been pieced together, the last episode was written entirely by Matt Groening. Fun fact about Matt Groening, he um, also did Beavis and Butthead, which, I'll be honest, I loved a lot growing up. I used to sneak up at, you know, three in the morning to watch it when I was a kid. During the production of the first series, Matt started to act strangely. He was reticent and seemed nervous and morbid, mentioning this to anyone who's present results in them getting very angry and forbidding you to ever mention it to Matt. The episode's production number was 7G44. The title was Dead Bart. In addition to getting angry, asking anyone who was on the show about this will cause them to do everything they can to stop you from directly communicating with Matt Groening. At a fan event, I managed to follow him after he spoke to a crowd, eventually having had the chance to talk to him alone as he was leaving the building. He, hadn't, he didn't seem upset that I followed him. He probably expected a typical encounter with an obsessive fan. When I mentioned the lost episode, all color drained from his face and he started trembling. When I asked him if he could give me any details, he sounded like he was on the verge of tears. He grabbed a piece of paper and wrote something on it and handed it to me. He begged me never to mention the episode again. The piece of paper has a web address on it. I'd rather not say what it was. For reasons you'll see in a second, I entered the address into my browser and came to a completely black site, except for a line of yellow text to download link. I clicked on it and the file started downloading. Once the file was downloaded, my computer went crazy. It was the worst virus I'd ever seen. System Restore didn't work. The entire computer had to be rebooted. Before doing this, though, I copied the file to a CD. I tried to open it on my now empty computer, and as I suspected, there was an episode of The Simpsons on it. The episode started off like any other episode, but had abysmal quality animation. If you've seen the original cartoon for some enchanted evening, it was similar but less stable. First act was pretty standard, but the way the characters acted was a little off. Homer seemed angry, or Marge seemed depressed, and Lisa seemed anxious. Bart seemed to have a genuine anger and hatred for his parents. 
The episode was about the Simpsons going on a plane trip. Near the end of the first act, the plane was taken off. Bart was fooling around as you'd expect. However, the aircraft is about 50 feet off the ground. Bro Bart broke a window in the plane and was sucked out. At the beginning of the series, Matt had an idea for a Simpsons World animated style represented by life and death and thing turned things more realistic. This was used in this episode. The picture of Bart's corpse was barely recognizable. They took full advantage of it not having to move and made an almost photorealistic drawing of his dead body. Act 1 ended on the shot of Bart's corpse when the two started. Homer, Marge, and Lisa were sitting at their table crying. The crying went on and on. It got more painted, sounded more realistic, better acting than you'd think possible. Animation started to decay even more as they cried and you could hear the murmuring in the background. The crying went on for all of Act 2. Act 3 opened up with the title card saying one year had passed. Marge, Homer, Marge, and Lisa were skeletally thin and still sitting at the table. There's no sign of Maggie or the pits. You know, this kind of reminds me, I'm probably going to have to do Squidward's suicide eventually. Another lost episode stuff. They decided to, um, to visit Bart's grave. Springfield was utterly deserted and they walked to the cemetery. The houses became more and more decrepit. They looked. They all looked abandoned. When they got to the grave, Bart's body was just laying in front of his tombstone, looking just like it did at the end of Act One. The family started crying again. Eventually, they stopped just and just stared at Bart's body. The camera zoomed in on Homer's face. According to summaries, Homer tells a joke at this point, but it isn't audible in the version I saw. You don't know what Homer's saying. The view zoomed out as the episode came to a close. The tombstones in the background had the names of every Simpsons guest star on them. Some that no one had heard, heard of in 1989. Some that hadn't even been on the show yet. All of them had death dates on them. For guests who died since, like Michael Jackson and George Harrison, the dates were when they would die. You can try to use the tombstone to predict the death of the Living Simpsons guest stars, but there's something odd about most of the ones who haven't died yet. All their deaths are listed as the same date. Credit to K.I. Simpson. And that was Dead Bart. Final thoughts? Mm, mixed. It sounds like they had a, a pretty good idea about the whole, oh, Simpsons predict all these other things, but the fact of the matter is, it's not so much that they're predicting it, so much as they're making humor of currently existing, you know, political ideas people have at the time that they're made. So, the fact that they just happen to show up before something like that actually happens is more to do with just the political climate we're in for the most part. So that's why I'm, I find it a little hard to believe that they'd have the exact dates that these, you know, actors would die. That's, that's just, you know, really pushing the suspension of disbelief. Now, as far as, uh, as far as stories are concerned, I mean, I do believe that, that they would make an episode you know, with um, Bart actually dying because they've done some similarly grotesque things with their Treehouse of Horror episodes and, and the like. So I could totally see them at some point doing a dead Bart thing or making Bart into a zombie at some point in the near future, but time will tell if they even humor this type of a story in an actual episode. So, all in all, I'd say it's it's a pretty good idea for, like, a Halloween special they could do, but other than that, it's not exactly something that particularly creeps me out. But then again, neither do the Trios of Horror episodes, so... I'd give it a... I'd say it's pretty much got the score it deserved for the most part on this one. And now for a last one, as I mentioned before, I, I didn't do this one on the other episode, though... I thought about it because of how brief it is. And this is called He Who Should Not Be Named, aka Candle Jack. So this is the third Jack. And it was rated 6.85 out of 10 from 5,000 or so votes. In this world, there exists a spirit neither male nor female. The spirit is covered with a dark cloth with a separate white cloth to wrap its head. It's said to carry an enormous brown burlap sack in which it holds its victims. The second its name is called out either directly or indirectly, or the person is collected and becomes 
The person is collected and becomes property of the spirit. Many who have witnessed its appearance have gone insane and were later found with eyes gouged out. The spirit is very, very real, and failure to prevent the mention of the name will cause Candle Jack to come and whisk you. The writer is whisked away before he could type away. Now, okay, and that was Candle Jack. Final thoughts? Yeah, you might have noticed there's something different from the posting, and I'm, and it's mainly because my grandma I said, a what? No, don't you mean away? And I'm, I, I said, okay, well, I, I better, just so the grammar checker doesn't continue to ding us on this, say that, okay, they were clearly interrupted before they could say away. Because it would have taken more than a second for them to finish the sentence before they actually were. That being the case, um, it's short, it's sweet, it's, um, and it, and it really does give that vibe that, um, that, yeah, there might be some reality to this if we can suspend our disbelief. However, it raises the question how they were able to to write this particular story or how anyone, anyone was able to, to speak the name long enough that they could even hit submit on this thing. That's where the, the big error I see in it is. Otherwise, it makes for an interesting story by itself. It's, it kind of reminds me of that, um, I think it was the Twilight Zone episode about the creature called the Griver. While it, it, it begs the question how anyone could live to tell the tale considering what happened to them in the episode. You know, I suppose maybe the creature itself wrote that or, or had somebody write that about them in exchange for not, you know, taking their life. Hence the legend continued to go into infamy at the time. It's hard to say. The entire Twilight Zone seems to be one heck of a time paradox up in and of itself if you try to analyze it too hard. That being the case, this has been Monster Mondays, episode 14, with your host, the Forsaken Scribe. And remember, Mom's not here, kids. Goodbye. <laughs>